den Richtlinien so vorgenommen worden sind, wie wir das für richtig halten. Das heißt... The Cut Purse by William Georgeberg The road home from war is long and hard. No fanfares for the defeated, no glorious parades. Sleeping in foul ditches, hiding from marauding bandits. Sir Giles de Ville often recalled the sunny spring afternoon he followed his duke out of the valley all agleam in silver-chased armor. Penance gay as fighting cocks, and plod on muleback by his side. Five thousand miles of hard campaigning lay ahead of that bright procession. Plague took his squire. The finely forged armor was sold piecemeal for food, long after Sir Giles devoured his prancing black charger and plod's mule to boot. Out of all of his fine equipage, Sir Giles kept only his broadsword. A man needed some defense in these hard times. Foot sore, he used it as a staff, hobbling toward the next village, a squalid collection of log huts sunk in the mud like wallowing pigs. He remembered glorious times, days of victory and exaltation, ramparts breached and towns put to the torch. Silk beds awaited the new masters, and in them silken women to keep the heroes warm at night, murmuring dove-like in their throaty, unfamiliar tongues. Sir Giles dwelled in that past, savoring moments of triumph. He recalled riding the vanguard, sword held high, and plod struggling behind with a treasure-laden pack train. The spoils were all lost. Rubies and pearls and clean gold coins had slipped away like sand through his fingers. Grains of sand in an hourglass, Sir Giles thought, the days of his life squandered like stolen treasure, and instead of silk sheets, he was lucky to have a pallet of lice-infested straw at night. The tattered warrior limped to the door of the village inn, hoping for a few hours by the fire in exchange for whatever menial labor the landlord might offer. Sir Giles was lucky in his choice of lodging. When the innkeeper saw the cross sewn to his ragged cloak, he not only had his place by the fire, but a full loaf of bread and a bowl of stew to dunk it in. Nothing too good for a palmer. It was enough for the weary crusader to sit telling tall tales and answer his host's questions about the Holy Land. When the candles guttered low, well past the time when decent Christian folk were snug in bed, the innkeeper bade Sir Giles good night his head a whirl with Saracens and swordplay. Guests slept in the taproom, catch as catch can by the fire. The landlord stayed in the loft upstairs with his family. He was on his way when a loud knock at the barred door yielded an elderly Jewish merchant seeking refuge from the storm. If it was no trouble, might there be a space in the barn for a weary traveler to pass the night? The publican was indignant. He'd not have his stables defiled by a Jew. With a sharp curse, he ordered the old man back out into the rain. Sir Giles interceded, reminding his host of another innkeeper who denied a family lodging more than a millennium before. Filled with remorse and Christian charity, the landlord relented and, to his own amazement, even offered this Hebrew space on the floor by the fire. What would his wife say in the morning, he wondered, climbing the rickety ladder to the loft. In spite of all seeming benevolence, Sir Giles' motives were far from altruistic. As he made room for the merchant, he couldn't take his eyes off the fat purse dangling from the old man's belt. It seemed plump as a ripe fig and ready for the plucking. The elderly Semite spread out a fine fur robe, muttering gratitude in his guttural accent. All thoughts elsewhere, Sir Giles paid scant attention to these thanks. Soon, the old man was snoring like a gristmill. Wide awake, Sir Giles stared into the coals, remembering the bright glow of lost treasure. 
ragged as a beggar, he had nothing to show for years of hardship and danger. Shame burned in him like a fever. If only he had a new mount and some fine clothes. If he at least looked the part of a conquering hero, his homecoming need not be so wretched. Sir Giles studied the snoring merchant, noting the exquisite fabric of his tunic and the fine cut of his hose. This Christ killer dresses better than one who fought for the true cross, he thought. Look at that bulging purse, stuffed with the profits of usury and greed. Enough in there to outfit a prince, and the old lone shark will have it all back inside a month. Casting aside his vows as a knight, Sir Giles drew a dagger from his boot top and slit the old man's purse strings as easily as cutting his throat. Sir Giles stumbled through the frozen woods, the merchant's purse jingling in his fist. Lucky for him I didn't steal his life, he panted, lurching for shelter under the lip of an overhanging boulder. Wanting light as much as warmth, Sir Giles gathered a pile of twigs and kindled a small blaze with his tinderbox. By the flickering firelight, his trembling fingers untied the knots securing the purse. Anxiously, Sir Giles poured his booty onto his lap. A soiled silk napkin, enough copper coins to buy a meal or two, five horn buttons, a silver thimble marked with the Star of David, and a curious amber bead carved like a troll. The wretched knight's heart sank. I've sold my honor for this dross, he lamented, about to hurl it all into the darkness, but other instincts prevailed. His virtue was already lost. Better a full belly than easing his conscience with empty gestures. Sir Giles settled back, falling fast asleep, the stolen purse tight in his hands. He dreamed of home, broad green meadows spread before him, golden cornfields stretched away on every side. From far in the distance, sweeter than trilling birds, his wife's happy song drifted through the pollen-scented air. The mendicant knight had dreamed this same dream every day for years. He knew it by heart. His favorite part was seeing his golden-haired children playing with the ducks on the mill pond. Tonight was mysteriously different. Instead of Roderick and Isobel, surrounded by quacking mallards, a deformed figure waited by the turning mill wheel. Sir Giles rode his dream mount through the cattails growing along the pond. The little man attending him was the spitting image of the carved amber troll in the stolen purse. The dwarf tugged his forked beard and stared up at the armor-clad knight. Well, well, well. His voice was exactly that of the Hebrew merchant. This is your lucky night. There are only two left. Two of what? asked Sir Giles. Why, wishes, you blamed fool. What sort of charm do you think I am? Sir Giles had no idea, having never seen the likes of the little man before in his life. I am a wish granter, pure and simple. I come to men in their dreams and fulfill their heart's desires. Been around a long time, started out with a thousand wishes and granted all save two. Both of them yours, long as you keep me in your purse. What must I do to receive these wishes? laughed the dreaming Sir Giles. Do? Why, not a damn thing. You don't need to do nothing but sleep and dream. Wish what you will, and when you wake, you'll find it granted. Best dream in ages, thought Sir Giles, saying, In that case, I wish to be equipped as on the day I set out for war, with a fine charger and armor forged by a master smith. Done, snorted the little troll, clapping his hands three times. Only one more to go, and I can get some rest after all these hundreds of years. With that, he waded straight into the mill pond, until only the peak of his pointed red cap showed above the surface. Sir Giles waited for the little fellow to lift his head and breathe. After a bit, he grew worried and urged his mount chest deep into the water. Reaching over the saddle, he plucked up the floating red cap. It was all that was left. The tiny troll had vanished. The rest of the night was fitfully spent. Sir Giles tossed and turned, his dreams a succession of nightmares. A breeze, fanning his cheek, woke him. The pale sun glittered on the ice-covered branches. He stretched and rubbed his eyes, and that was when he heard the horse snorting behind him. Sir Giles de Ville looked over his shoulder and rubbed his eyes a second time, pawing the ground with the fury of Bucephalus reincarnate. The most beautiful stallion the knight had ever seen stood tethered to a nearby tree. White as an altar cloth, with a mane far finer than spun silver, he was worthy of the Archangel Michael. Sir Giles staggered to his feet like a sleepwalker, approaching the magnificent animal in disbelief. But this was no dream. 
The white horse felt warm beneath his touch, the bunched muscles giving promise of speed and power. The arched neck and proud carriage bespoke a noble lineage. Embroidered on the saddlecloth were the arms of the House of Deville. The armor stacked beneath the tree also was marked with Sir Giles' crest. Not even the Duke owned such an exquisitely fashioned panoply. His bones lay in Syria, encased within a rusting helm and cuirass. Pale shadows of the worksmanship displayed here. Sir Giles put on a velvet doublet and the silken hose he found in the saddlebags. They fit him perfectly, as did the armor his trembling fingers bolted in place. He admired his new reflection in the polished surface of his shield. This time he was coming home in style. If life was a dream, the world would sleep forever, lost in an eternity of blissful reverie. Sir Giles de Ville's awakening came when he topped the rise overlooking the valley and trotted his fine white horse past the stone bridge at the head of his summer pasture. All his endless fantasies of home dissolved at the sight of the parched earth and blasted trees. His fields lay fallow and barren, the orchards blighted. Death and decay surrounded him like an evil malady. Things grew worse when the manor came into view. The barns and outbuildings were in ruins. Charred roof beams thrust above the fallen walls. Sir Giles spurred his horse to a gallop, but even at this distance he saw the great hall was lifeless, the windows blank and desolate, like empty eye sockets in a skull. He dismounted outside the yawning front entrance. All was silent save for the random banging of a broken shutter in the wind. The frantic knight ran up the weed-choked path, afraid to call out for his loved ones, afraid to hear his voice pronounce their names. He looked into the shambles of what was once a splendid banquet chamber. The furnishings lay splintered across the floor. Through a dim haze of smoke he saw a tattered man crouching by a small fire on the hearth, a homeless beggar such as he had recently been himself. "'Who are you?' he cried, rushing toward the tramp sword in hand. "'What has happened here?' The vagabond cowered in terror, his yellowed eyes fixed on the threatening blade. Please excuse me, kind sir, he whimpered. I am but a wayfarer taking refuge for the night. Sir Giles lowered his sword. Where is the family who dwells here? Long gone, the ragged man sagged against the sooty wall. Carried off by the plague, they say. The householder was away in the wars and no one to defend the place against looters. The world be full of vile thieves, moors the pity. Then they're all dead. Aye, dead as dreams. The grieving knight's strangled cry was as bleak as an icy wind blowing across a thousand miles of frozen wasteland. He dropped his sword and staggered into the sunlight, the terrible sound hissing from him as if he'd been shot through the lungs by an arrow. Fumbling in the stolen purse, Sir Giles found the amber figurine. He clenched it in his fist, dropping the rest, and slumped beside a broken wagon. He thought he would never sleep, that grief would keep him awake for the rest of his life, but a weariness more profound than sorrow took hold. He felt exhausted, clear to his bones, and lapsed almost immediately into a deep and abiding slumber. He dreamed he was in a marble palace with patterned mosaic floors and fluted columns of purple porphyry. Birds warbled in sunlit courtyards. Lovely fountains splashed like purling mountain streams. Sir Giles wandered from one ornate room to the next, marveling at the intricate tapestries and splendid statuary. At last he came to an atrium surrounding an azure pool where languid hyacinths floated. The little troll reclined on a couch beside a table laden with fruit and wine. He was dressed like an oriental in a silk caftan and matching turban. So, he said, spitting pomegranate seeds into a golden vessel, come for your final wish? Yes, Sir Giles wanted to fall on his knees in supplication. Well, don't just stand there fumbling. Out with it. I'm getting a head start on my retirement and won't be kept waiting by the likes of you. What is it this time? Riches? Fame? How about some power? Like to rule a little kingdom by the sea? No, no, none of that, Sir Giles was close to tears. Please, make everything as it was, my home and family. I want it all as I remember before I left for war. The little troll grinned. Easy enough, he said, mouthing another handful of pomegranate. I thought you were going to ask for something difficult. Turning back the clock's no problem. Just open your eyes and your wish is granted. Me? I plan on relaxing in style for the next million years. 
Sir Giles opened his eyes. Pale green leaves stirred overhead. Butterflies swirled against the faint blue sky. The sweet scent of pollen drifted in the evening breeze. Above the drone of bees, he heard his cattle lowing, and the merry sound of his children's laughter carrying over the farmyard bustle. His wife was scolding them, but when he tried to lift his head, he found he couldn't move. He lay there, rigid as a board. His wife's angry, mournful words stabbed across the crispuscular stillness. Roderick! Isabel! How dare you play at such an unhappy time! Yonder lies your father, cold as clay in his coffin. This is no maypole frolic, tis a wake for a brave soldier, home dead from battle, his wounds sealed with wax, and his soul, I pray, safe in paradise. Sir Giles de Ville wanted to cry out, but his tongue turned to stone in his mouth, and his eyes glazed like puddles gone to ice. A curtain of eternal darkness shrouded his dreams forever after. Hey, Billy, why do you look so down? Aw, oh, Dad, I got a computer, a PlayStation, and a barn full of iguanas, and I'm still bored. <sighs> Gee, Billy, when I was your age, I would read lots of stories in pulp magazines. Oh, with stories of weird adventure and fantasy, horror, satire, and lots of action. Wow, that sounds great, Dad. Yeah, I sure wish there was something like that right now. <laughs> there is Daddy-O! Who are you? I'm Dr. Mary Von Roxbrocket, host of the Twisted Pulp Radio Hour, and now there's... Yeah? Twisted Pulp Magazine! <laughs> What's that, Doctor? Why, it is a return to greatness! Available on all your digital devices! That is what it is! Look! This looks awesome! Exciting and, dare I say it, very unwholesome. You definitely have that right, my good man. Ha <laughs> ha! Thanks, Dr. Mary! My pleasure, Billy. And just between you and me, I am not sure that this man is really your father. Bye! Dad? Uh, just read your Twisted Pulp magazine, Billy. Twisted Pulp magazine! Available in dark alleyways behind meth labs everywhere. Or at Amazon.com or ArchaicMedia.info. That is A-R-C-H-A-I-C-M-E-D-I-A dot info. <laughs> A Few Imperfections by Thomas M. Malafarina. Narrated by Nancy Bueller. There is a kind of beauty in imperfection. Conrad Hall. Things are beautiful if you love them, Jean and we. In our world of readily available cosmetic surgery, it is possible that an attractive couple could end up having an ugly baby and not understand why. Thomas M. Malafarina. The young, obviously wealthy couple drove along the winding country road at a speed much faster than they should have been driving. Despite the fact that their Lexus LS460 with its $80,000 price tag was equipped to handle the curves, they were still traveling at too high of a speed. This was probably the result of the intense discussion going on inside the vehicle, one that was rapidly degenerating into a full-blown argument. What in the hell are we supposed to do, Stephen? Angela asked, genuinely concerned. What do you mean? Stephen asked, feigning ignorance yet knowing exactly what she was talking about. It was all she had been talking about since they got in the car after leaving the hospital. Tucked away in the back seat of the sedan, safely secured in his car seat, their newborn baby boy, Stephen Thurston Wellington III, cooed to himself, oblivious to the conversation which was taking place in the front of the car, or the fact that he was the subject of that conversation. You know exactly what I mean. What are we going to do about the baby and his appearance? Angela, please, I don't understand what you're getting so upset about. He's only two days old, for God's sakes. Stephen said, trying to look at the situation rationally and simultaneously calm his wife down. However, he knew his effort was likely wasted, since once Angela got an idea into her head, nothing could stop her from venting. But, but, he's, he's hideous, Stephen. There, I've, I've finally said it aloud. And don't tell me you haven't been thinking the exact same thing. I saw the way you looked at him. 
Jesus, Angela, that's an incredibly horrible and thoughtless thing to say about your own child. My God, how could you even think such a thing, let alone express it? I know, and I feel terrible saying it, but for Christ's sake, Stephen, somebody has to address the ugly elephant in the room. You have to agree with me, Stephen. He's, he's heinous. Now, I wouldn't say anything as drastic as that, Angela. He might be a bit odd-looking, but maybe even a tad on the funny-looking side. But all newborns are less attractive than they should be, with their wrinkly pink skin and pinched faces. It's perfectly normal. I'm sure he'll look better as he grows. I'll admit he has a few imperfections, but I'm sure we'll get used to them. No, no, I don't think I can, Stephen. I think there's something very wrong with him, with little Stephen's looks. I mean, how in the world could two people, as good-looking as we are, manage to create such an atrocious-looking little child? You know we're both very attractive, Stephen. I don't think it vain to admit such a thing, do you? No, I suppose not, Stephen replied, not certain he agreed. He knew what she said about them, however, was true. They were both quite attractive. Maybe there was a mix-up at the hospital. Maybe they gave us some ugly couple's baby and they got our baby by mistake. Do you think that's possible, Stephen? No, I don't. They have all sorts of safeguards in place for that kind of thing. Besides, we both saw him being born. We saw him the second he took his first breath. That's our baby, Angela. Now, getting back to your original question about how we could have a less than attractive child... If you think about it, the only reason we're both so good-looking is that we can afford to look so good. Our parents were both wealthy, and we were only children, so fixing our imperfections wasn't a big deal for them. After they died, we inherited all of their money. We also earned good incomes on our own. We eat well, we go to the gym, we pamper ourselves at spas, and we generally take good care of ourselves. Also, as you may recall, when we met a few years ago, you had told me you had some work done over the years before we knew each other. Yes, I did mention I had a few minor alterations, and you admitted to having some cosmetic work done yourself, didn't you? I did, but now that I think about it, I don't believe we ever discussed what sorts of procedures we had done. Perhaps that's something we should have discussed. Maybe you're right, Stephen. Perhaps we should have. I mean, it's not really a big deal. When I was a preteen, I had a severe overbite, and my parents got me braces to straighten up my teeth. If I remember correctly, you had braces as well, didn't you? Yes, as did most of the boys in my boarding school. My teeth were quite twisted and a bit gnarly, but the braces and a few orthodontic surgeries took care of that. And we both have poor eyesight and have a laser surgery to correct our vision issues so we don't have to wear glasses. When I was about 10, I also had a minor surgery to correct a muscular issue with my left eye that caused it to turn inward sometimes. Well, that explains a lot, Angela said with sudden realization. I think little Stephen might have had the same eye thing. Stephen shot back. What do you mean? He can't even see yet. His eyes don't have the ability to focus. That's why they seem to roam all over the place. Seriously, are you going to try to blame me for all of this? We made this child together, Angela. He was created from genes from both of us. So tell me, what else have you had done that I don't know about? As I told you, it was all minor and insignificant things. For example, my nose was a bit wide and I had it thinned out a bit several years ago. I also just recalled something else I had forgotten about. When I was about four, my ears stuck out and my mother took me to a doctor who pinned them back for a while until they stayed back on their own. Our baby's ears stick way out, Stephen added. In fact, he looks like a taxi cab driving down the highway with both its doors open. And he has a funny looking wide nose. So those deformities obviously must have come from you. Yeah, well, what about that weak chin of his? He barely has any chin at all. His mouth hangs open in a hangdog fashion that makes him look half retarded. I think he got that from you, Stephen. Tell me, was that jutting, masculine, Hollywood-leaning man chin of yours with you since birth, or did you have it modified? Stephen hesitated for a moment, then admitted, Okay, I might have not had much of a chin when I was younger and may have had minor implant surgery to enhance it, but my chin issues were not as severe as the baby's. Aha! Angela shouted. Another flaw of yours, which apparently was destined to curse our poor malformed baby. She took off her seatbelt and turned around to try to examine the baby closer, but she was unable to see him tucked away as he was in his car seat. Angela, for the last time, he's not malformed, he just has a few imperfections. And since we're pointing out those imperfections, what about that unibrow of his? No one in my family ever had any such thing. As I recall from pictures of your dad when he was alive, he had quite the crop of eyebrow foliage. Tell me, Angela, did you inherit that and maybe have it surgically removed as well? I... I... I might have once had a bit more hair between my brows than I would have cared for. Maybe I did have it removed with a bit of laser work. 
So, you are the one responsible for that wooly caterpillar crawling across my baby's eyebrows after all. But what about his big, bulging eyes? My eyes are normal, and they always have been. You're the one with the protruding moon eyes, dear, Angela said sarcastically. Moon eyes? You used to call them large, luminous pools of emotion. Now you call them moon eyes? Why don't you just call them bug eyes as long as you're being so nasty? And to make matters worse, you think my eyes are ugly on our baby. I really don't get you, Angela. Yeah, well, maybe we should have had this discussion before we decided to create that little cave troll in the back seat. Cave troll? Honest to God, Angela. Can't believe you could say such a thing about your own flesh and blood. You're nothing but a self-centered cow. Stephen was now staring daggers at Angela, feeling like he was speaking with some horrible creature he had never met before. Oh, just wonderful. Make fun of my additional weight after I just gave birth to your little freak. Stephen was furious. For the first time in his married life, he felt like reaching over and punching his wife right in the face. As a result, he took his eyes off the highway for just a few seconds too long. As he approached a curve in the road, a large buck strolled lazily out of the woods and onto the roadway and right in his path. Look out, Stephen! Angela screamed. Stephen did the one thing he should never have done, and that was he swerved to avoid hitting the beast. He quickly lost control of his sedan and skidded off the highway down a steep embankment and full bore right into a giant clump of trees. The front of their sedan slammed into a huge tree, and one of its broken branches crashed through the windshield and pierced Stephen's heart, killing him instantly. His corpse was pinned behind the wheel as last of his blood spurted from his chest and trickled from his mouth and down his chin. A split second later, Angela, who had not refastened her seatbelt, flew through the windshield and became impaled on several other remnants of branches. She, unfortunately, took several minutes to die as she hung pierced and screaming in agony. The last sound she heard as her lifeblood pumped from her body were the cries of her ugly baby, apparently still safe and unharmed, secured in his car seat. Several hours later, the rescue workers had successfully removed both of the corpses from the scene and had gotten the baby out of the back seat of the sedan. One of the emergency medical technicians was a young woman named Naomi Jacobson. She was holding the baby and rocking it after having determined the boy was uninjured. Naomi was a short, stocky woman who at first glance one might consider a bit unattractive if not somewhat homely. She was, however, happily married to an equally stout man and less than attractive man who owned a plumbing business. The two had been unable to conceive and had been on a waiting list for possible adoption for many years, yet to date they had been unsuccessful. Naomi wanted a baby more than anything else in the world. She looked down at the wrinkled little boy with his odd-looking nose, unibrow, slightly twisted mouth, and ears which stuck outward, and she fell instantly in love. She thought he was the most beautiful baby she had ever seen. Sure, he had a few imperfections, but who didn't? She decided she would speak with the agent from Child Services when she arrived and tell her she would love to be able to adopt this baby if by some chance there were no living relatives to claim the child. Unknown to Naomi at that time, her wish would come true. This is Jackie Ayers, and you've been listening to Dead Airwaves on KKRN. Episode 6, Cut Purse, by William Hortzberg, read by E.S. Wynn. A Few Imperfections, by Thomas M. Malafarina, read by Nancy Bueller. Theme music, by Tim Slade.